Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope the sun is shining wherever you are in the country um, or wherever you are in the world, or if you've got the sun today, if you're heading off to bed after this. Um, you're all very welcome to our Step Into Your Power event today. So we have a jam-packed couple of hours coming up with great speakers and a panel discussion hosted by our very own Deputy President Sinead Donovan and a number of our very valued members who have been brave enough to join the panel and have a discussion about their own challenges and um, bring those kind of themes to life. So we're delighted to be working with the young professionals on this event and want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, PeopleSource, and you'll be hearing from Rachel a bit later. Um, so hopefully the kids are in school um, or in bed and the coffee is on board and uh, we're just about to kick off. But just for a moment, I just want to take a pause and um, honour somebody I think that's been in our hearts and our minds this week, um, the very uh, special and the very lovely uh, Vicky uh, we, uh, Phelan who passed away this week. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Vicky was a fearless woman who, despite a devastating diagnosis, fought long and hard for women's health care rights in this country. Um, so she was someone that we will remember as selfless and for making it all about other people, despite literally fighting for her life. So, Vicky, we're thinking about you today and we're thinking about your family today. So just wanted to take a second to, to honour Vicky. So the theme of today's event emerged um, on the back of a new survey that was carried out with over 3,000 chartered accountants across the globe, looking at what they felt was the main barriers to progressing in their careers. Our respondents called out motherhood and caring for their children as the number one obstacle to reaching to the, th the top. So this motherhood penalty uh, was also highlighted by Sinead Donovan in a recent article in uh, Accountancy Ireland, Smashing the Glass Ceiling when she talks about how a break from work can negatively impact a woman's career. She believes it can only be corrected when it becomes accepted that the no, as, no, as the norm that the men in our lives and partners um, can take a gap year and share in the family responsibilities. So in that same survey, the respondents felt the number one enabler to progression in our careers is flexible working policies. So just this week in Finland, they announced they have reached a significant milestone. For the first time, men and women now spend an equal amount of time caring for their children. So this could have something to do with the fact that the men and the women in Finland receive the exact same amount, amount of parental leave. So that's 164 days each. So it kind of stands to reason that they're both sharing the workload and the, the childcare evenly. So the second barrier to progression reported in this survey was lack of confidence. And I think that's what brings us here today. So what can we do individually to tackle this lack of confidence in ourselves? So maybe if we start with the premise that when you step into your power, you need to step out of your comfort zone. So we need to tackle some of those limiting beliefs that we have all held, that have held us back for so long and kept us, kept us from flourishing in our professional and our personal lives. So our first guest speaker today knows all about barriers and obstacles. And just last week, she's published her first book, Get Unstuck, Ditch the Drama and Move from Pain to Power. Love that title, Neve. Um, where she tells her own story of personal struggles. Neve is a change and transformation coach who has helped thousands of people to get their lives back on track. And in her spare time, writes for Image Magazine, The Irish Times and The Sunday Business Post, among many others. Neve, you're very welcome to Chartered Accountants Ireland. And I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dee. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here with you and with your members this morning. So I'm going to just dive straight into it. And the theme, obviously, as Dee just said, there is about stepping into our power. And I'm going to come at it from the angle about when we find ourselves stuck and what we can do to come unstuck. Now, just before I do, you can all see the slides, I'm hoping, and that we're good to go. So what's my story? My, what led me to relinquishing my power, to giving my power away, was that over a little over 15 years ago, I experienced a number of very close bereavements in a very short space of time. My fiance, my dad and my mom, who were my only family unit, um, all died very suddenly and very separately. And so it obviously threw me into, into a world that I, you know, I knew very little about and a world full of grief and loss and bereavement. However, four, possibly five years later, I realized that I'd become very addicted to the sympathy and to the pity that people had so kindly and generously given to me. 
But that realization that I didn't know who I was without the pity, without the sympathy, was one that actually quite shocked me. And that was my that was my um, awakening, I suppose, to the fact that I had now given over my power. And so I had to go about putting steps in place to help me to step back into that power. So when it comes to um, when it comes to looking at ways that we can reclaim our power or to pull back and step into our power, I'm just going to talk through six very quick steps. The first of these steps is all about getting clarity. When we want to move from one place to another, when we want to step from one place to another, we need to have a really strong sense about where it is that we're going, what the end destination looks like, what it is, what outcome it is that we want, what does that look like, and most importantly, how will we feel when we get there? So a question that I often ask people, and it might seem a little um, ethereal at the moment, but it's this one, and it's a really important one. But think about and ask yourself, who is it that you want to become? And a journaling prompt that may help you or may encourage you in terms of being able to dig deep on, on this answer. It, this is one that I use quite regularly. If you had no fear and there were no obstacles, what is it you would do? Step two. Step two is all about identifying what's blocking you, what's getting in your way. What is it that's holding you back? And that the answer to that can come in, in identifying what your greatest fears are, in identifying what your limiting beliefs are, and also just being very truthful with yourself as to what the stories are that you're living your life from. So, for example, I, what I talked about earlier was that at that time in my life, 15 years ago, I had to recognize that the story I was living my life from was this. It was I believed that I was the girl who bad things happened to. I was I believed that I was the girl who people died on, who people left, who people abandoned. And actually, that story, while it may have been true for a very short period of time, it wasn't serving me. And it was actually forcing me into a situation that was leaving me feeling rather powerless. Step three, rediscovering what your values are. Now, there's been a lot of talk, particularly during the time of the pandemic, that we use that time to reevaluate where we are in our lives or where we were in our lives. And actually, to a great extent, I think that's true. I think because we had that time, because we had that space, it allowed us to look at every aspect of our life, our work, our, our relationships, our health, you know, we were all able to maybe dedicate a little bit more time to it. And in that, it allowed us then to, to re-examine what our values were. Now, for most of us as children, if we're fortunate enough, we are given our values by our parents. We're told to be honest, to be kind, to be fair, to be hardworking. You know, they're all very good and very strong values. But what we don't don't account for is that our values change as we move from one stage of our life to the next. As we grow, as we evolve, and as we transform, so too do our values. So what mattered to you six months ago may not matter to you so much now. And that's the point of this, the point of trying to ascertain what your values are, or the best way to ask yourself that question is to ask what matters most to me right now. And when we know what our values are, you might ask that question and come up with two or three different answers. When you know what your values are, it helps you enormously when it comes to making better decisions. So, for example, if one of your values are you know, family and wanting to spend more time with your family, there is a, a good chance then that if you're looking to change careers or you're looking to move jobs, you're probably not or should not be attracted to a job that's going to involve a huge amount of travel because that won't match your value. And that from the outset, if you're doing something that's moving you away from your values, that's where you're going to feel at your most unhappy. So the importance there is about all about creating a life that feels good on the inside, not based on how it looks or how it might appear on the outside. 
Step four, and this one might feel a little bit unusual, but when we go through a life changing event or when we go through or hit a little bump in the road, as we all do at some point or another, we disconnect. We disconnect from our head and our heart. And, and I find it hard to talk about this and not use lots of hand gestures. But if you think of that as a, as a happy, healthy, functional person, we are engaging our heads and our hearts when it comes to making decisions, when it comes to feelings, when it comes to doing things. But when something un, unplanned, unexpected, unwanted happens to us, no matter what that might be to you, we tend to retreat immediately into our headspace because it's here we feel we have most control. And our headspace is where we do our planning, our organizing, our budgeting, our financing. It's, it's here where we learn. It's here where we gather information. So there's a lot of very important actions happening in our heads. And so, as I say, it's all about us feeling more in control. However, it's our heart space when we disconnect from that, that we are missing out on our feelings, how we feel about things, how we feel, um, how we emote, how we love, how we hate. It's here our creativity lies. It's here even our spirituality lies. It's here our intuition lies. So many of those um, important aspects that make us essentially who we are belong in our heart space. And so when we are in a position where we feel out of sync, when we feel we've given away our power, coming back to our heart space can be a really, really good way of reclaiming our power. And I just added a little journaling prompt there that might help because it's one that helps us identify when, when we've disconnected our head and our heart. And that is, it is safe for me to feel and you fill in the blanks. Step five. A really important one, take responsibility. Now, this is the one that, that I referred to at the beginning when I realized I'd become addicted to, my, to the drama, to the sympathy, to the pity. And I also realized that, that I wasn't necessarily taking responsibility for what needed to happen going forward. Stop blaming everyone else. Blame, as we know, is really great for our ego, but responsibility is far better for our future. So when I talk about detaching from the drama, I, I'm, I'm really saying to you that you're not responsible for what happens to you. None of us are in, in so many situations, but we are wholly responsible for how we let it play out in our lives. And if we can only get ourselves to that point, to that place where we stop focusing on what's missing and we celebrate in, in the best possible way what is present in our lives, that really will help us enormously. So the tendency is always to point the finger. The tendency is always to pass the book. But it's only when we take ownership, when we accept responsibility, when we say, if I want to step back into my power, I am going to have to do it. I am not going to be able to say to somebody else's fault, I don't feel I have a possession of my own power. And, and that is true. It isn't anybody else's fault. It's ours and it's your responsibility. So that is why I think point number five or step number five is really important. Step number six, believe and trust. This one, you'll have to indulge me a little and allow me to go a little bit woo-woo on it. But but it's also, it's also where I really feel that so many of the solutions to these challenges, such as stepping into our power, lie. It's a combination of being able to bring the strategy, the practical, the steps, knowing, you know, the steps, knowing the, the schedule, knowing how, who you need to help you get there. It's having all those practical next steps and the strategic approach, but it's also having a much more soulful approach and combining the two of them together. So we do need to turn up and do the work and do the practical steps, but we also need to be able to trust in something bigger than ourselves. And when we trust in something bigger than ourselves, where it really helps us is that we don't feel quite so alone. We don't feel quite so, um, so helpless and so powerless. And when we don't believe that we have the capacity to change, 
that's why we don't make the progress when it comes to changing. So that's that's why I would urge you that if you are feeling disconnected or if you are feeling powerless and if you are unable to come up with the practical next steps, then ask for help. Reach out to somebody, a friend, a colleague, a professional. Just, you know, remember that none of us, none of us were ever meant to do this business of life alone. And being vulnerable and being open in a safe environment with somebody you trust is a really first step, uh, a really powerful first step in terms of reclaiming our power. Be because when we feel heard, when we feel supported, and when we start to believe not just the change is possible, but the change is possible for us, when we believe that, that's when we do it. So in summary, and I hope I haven't ran through those too quickly. And if I have, you know, the, the slides will be available afterwards and you'll be able to, to go back through them. But the summary for, 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 the con for this context is that you are not afraid of new opportunities. We all think we are. We all think, you know, how many times have you said or have you heard somebody else say, oh, I hate change. I'm no good at change. You're not afraid of, of the new opportunities. You're not afraid of experiencing new things or changes. What you're most afraid of is repeating some of the old patterns, the old disappointments um, of re-experiencing the betrayals or the loss or the hurt or their pain. So think about that the next time when you're resisting change. Think about that it's not actually, you're not scared of the outcome. You're scared of what might happen as you go through it. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. And don't catastrophize it. And, and I did not write that down because I couldn't spell it. I, I wrote it down because I thought I might have trouble pronouncing it. And just remember that you don't ever feel or choose to feel powerless, but you do choose to stay there. And on that note, I will leave you. And I leave you with, as, as Dee mentioned there, the copy of uh, my new book, um, uh, Get Unstuck. And, and I've also just added some uh, resources here that might help um, and that would allow you to go a little bit deeper. And um, there's a, a journaling uh, PDF there that will help anyone that's interested in journaling. There's also a free quiz there on helping somebody if they want to identify if they're a people pleaser and that that may be what's making them a little bit powerless. So if if there is anything there that that, that you'd like, then please uh, definitely um, feel free to avail of them. And um, thank you, Dee. Thank you for the opportunity this morning and, um, and good luck with the rest of your day. Thanks so much, Neve. Um, I have to say, I have to commend you on your honesty and admitting that you were addicted to, to grief and sympathy. I think that's a very empowering thing to kind of be aware of for yourself. So um, thank you for sharing that. And some fantastic tips and tricks there as well. Stop focusing on what's missing in life. And um, the, the values are always changing as well. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it because we kind of tend to think that those values are static. And I think yeah. that as you go through different life stages, I think all of that can change in yeah. an instant. So thank you so much. And we'll hear from you um, a little bit later at the uh, Q&A. So please feel free, of course, to put some, uh, some questions that are piquing your interest or come up for you today into the... Um, Q&A box um, and we'll come to those later. We'll have everybody back to have a, a, a quick chat at the end. So thank you so much, Neve. And um, so now I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Richard Hogan, who is a family psychologist, a psycho psychotherapist, psychologist, you can correct me on that one, Richard, and a regular contributor to um, both TV and radio. He often features on News Talk, The Today Show and Ireland AM as an expert in the field of human behaviour, where he offers his expertise and strategies on how to overcome mental health issues. Richard is also the author of best-selling book, Parenting the Screenager, which is a fantastic title, um, a practical guide for parents of the modern child. So hi, Richard, you're very hi, welcome morning, to the Institute. Dee. And I'll, I'll pass over to you. Thank you Thanks very, very much. Thanks very much, Dee. Thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. It's lovely to be here this morning, guys. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about how you can kind of step into yourself, basically, and move beyond some self-limiting ideas, how we how we start to thrive. I'm actually finishing a book at the moment all about the family and where we come in the family and our personality traits and our connection with our early primary caregiver, you know, our attachments. And basically, it's all about how do we become who we are 
and how do we get beyond some of the stuff that happened to us in our life um, as we were developing and as we were as our brain was coming online we distilled and swallowed so much information and that forms an incredible part about how we think about who we are in the world and that's a really important part of um, this kind of this brief talk today is about how the relationship we have we have three major relationships in our lives and that's the, our relationship with our body our relationship with others and our relationship with ourselves and what i'm going to talk about today is our relationship with ourselves how how can that be a bit better because that's such a vital part that 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 spills into all our other relationships our relationship how we come to talk to ourselves about who we are and what we're capable of and that's a part of the I'm a systemically trained family psychotherapist and a part of that there's a kind of a branch of study and they're called narrative therapy and it's all about the story that we tell you know ourselves about who we are and that is such an important part of actually learning to flourish in the world so as I get into it I just want to just talk to you a little bit about some of the personality traits that we can have and what I see in my clinic a lot and in particularly with women, you know, and I sit down with some fantastic women who are thinking about, you know, going for a position in their lives and or just sitting down and thinking about changing their lives. And 47.2 is our most unhappy year as human beings on this planet, 47.2. And if we were to analyze that, we'd have to say, well, why is that? Why is 47 so unhappy? And I would say, you know, my evaluation, my analysis of it, well, what happens to us is that by the time we hit, by the time we get to our forties or mid forties, life is incredibly complicated. We probably have a couple of children. Our parents are elderly or are aging, and um, our kids might be moving in towards adolescence. And so there's a lot of change going on around us, and we can sometimes lose contact with ourselves. If I, you know, if I had a penny for every time someone said to me in my clinic. You know, I don't even know what it's like to laugh anymore. I don't even know who I am anymore. I, I wonder where I am in all of this. And I, I always hear underneath that a really important personality trait. Uh, we've got five big personality traits. We have agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness, extroversion, and neuroticism. And the, the big one, I think, that, that most of us have, you know, we come with those five personality traits, and we some of those will be, you know, familiar to you, and some of them mightn't be so familiar to you. But one that we all kind of generally have, because we're so communal as a species, is agreeableness. And that can cause us an awful lot of problems if we have got high levels of that personality trait. And then think about where you came in your family. Let's say you're the eldest daughter in your family, or the eldest son in the family. And, um, you know, you get you get positioned there. You, you learn very early on in your life that to be valued, you have to, you know, you have to live up to that responsibility. You have to take on those chores. You have to be a good daughter there. And as you move into your adult life, you you get married and now you have to be a good wife to be valued. And, and now you have to be a good sister and a good now you're going to be a good mother. And so by the time you get to your 40s, you realize, my God, this persona that I took on, this avatar that I created for myself of this pleaser, this doer is actually unsustainable. And so by 47.2, you realize that you've created this world that's actually almost impossible to live or to, or to meet the demands of it and so all systems will fall into what we call in psychotherapy a balance a homeostasis and so if we've got high levels of agreeableness which means that we believe to be valued we have to say yes and we take on too much and so by the time we get to our mid 40s where we realize we're kind of overwhelmed by by the the way we've created our lives and so it's really important to think about your personality traits and to think about how that positions you and what would it be like? This is the key thing I'd like to talk to you today. What would it be like to say no to some things? And what would it be like to live and sit in the discomfort of others when you say no to them? And can you manage that? Because that's a very important thing. And I meet so many women in my clinic who, who say, you know, I, I find that very difficult to say no. And I find it very difficult if people don't aren't pleased with me or, you know, I, I want people to really like me. And, you know, and I, what, what I try to explain to them is that eventually when you're when you've got high levels of agreeableness and you and you take on it, you take on the chores, eventually you become cynical and resentful. You become resentful of the people that are positioning like that. But you also become resentful of yourself for allowing yourself to be positioned like that and for taking on too much when you know it's not healthy and you know it's not doing well for you in your life. You have to kind of step back from it a little bit and have a look at it. And that's what I'd like to look at it and have a quick look at today. This, this is just like a little quick hack and how we can get in there and disrupt some of those ideas. So we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, right? And 90% of those thoughts are actually what you thought yesterday. So we often think we're just thinking. We think we're thinking away and we think those things are fact. We think that we think those thoughts are facts. But in fact, what they actually are is old neural circuit loops. And so they're going around and around and around. 
And so if you, when you were developing, got messages to be valued, you have to say yes to things. And, you know, there's no position, there's no room you, for you in that family. There's no room for you here to be independent and say no to things. So you have to, to, to you know, to feel valuable, you have to say yes to everything. Now you're going to run that thought all through your life. And so what happens, this is literally what happens. Here's, here's our thought. There are billions of thoughts. There's a saying in neuroscience that says neurons that fire together, wire together. And what that means is that when you're thinking all these different thoughts, one thought happens like, you know, to be valuable, I need to say yes. And now you look around and your parents and your mother, your father position you in that place. And they say, oh, Sandra, you know, she's a great girl. She always does what she's told. And all of a sudden that becomes a pathway. And so the own that that means that's the only thought available to you. And so when you think about yourself, you think to be valuable, I have to say yes. If people are to appreciate me, I have to say yes. To be really liked here, I have to say yes. To say no would position me in a very awkward pl place. People wouldn't be happy with me. And so just think about that now. We have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day and 90% of those are what we thought yesterday. So we're thinking the same thing all the time. And that comes from right back in your childhood. And so think about like, you know, would you take advice from a nine-year-old girl or boy? And obviously the answer is no, but you're taking advice from them all the time. Those, their voices, that voice, that, that voice is running all the time. And we have lots of cognitive distortions that go on. And so we have to think about, and the question is like, do I have cognitive distortions? It's not that. It's the question is, which ones are running currently, which disrupt my life? Thoughts basically are like a smell in a house. We don't realize that they're not good for us. We don't realize they're not. We don't realize they're bad until somebody comes in and gives us feedback. And it's very important that we're, we're, we, we start to become our own little therapists here. And we start to think about our thoughts. And we start to think about how am I thinking? And it's something I meet massively in my clinic. People who say, and when I say to them, what would it be like to thrive? They're like, well, that would be very scary. And I'd say, well, what does that look like? Well, that would mean I'd have to say no to people and I'd have to start putting myself a bit first and I'd have to start really evaluating what it is I want for my life. And that might actually mean I'd have to work in the interest of my future self. And I'd say, well, well, what needs to happen for that to start in your life? And they'd say, well, maybe I have to start thinking about why I'm putting so many people's needs before my own. You know, and that's a really important thing to think about. And we can get so laden down by what things that have happened in our lives. As we come through our lives, we can hear terrible things about who we are. He's lazy. He's no good. He's not that intelligent. We can hear all these labels and labels don't predict the future. They write them. And so when we're going through, we start to live out these paradigms. But it's a really important moment that 47.2 doesn't have to be the unhappy year. You know, you can start to really thrive. I know it's kind of scary, but it's exhilarating. You can really start to look at your life and start thinking, what, how do I want to be? This is how I've been. How do I want to be for the next you know, few years? If, in five years time, what would I like to say about myself? Did I go for things? You know, was I open? That's a personality trait. Was I open to experience? Was I open to going for you know, um, promotions? Or did I hold myself back? Was I restricted? Was I scared, fearful? And think about that. You know, when you're fearful, which we all get from time to time, it's a natural part of our experience as human beings. Uh, you're, there's, we've got three responses. When I'm fearful, I try to control things. That is obsessive behavior. Right. And when I'm fearful, I might try to con might, I might try to avoid that's phobic behavior. And when I'm fearful, I might look for over like I might massively look for reassurance, which actually makes you even more fearful because you realize you're not able to manage the thing on your own. And just remember what Carl Jung said. You know, it's a really important thing. We're not we're, we're not what happened to us. We're who we choose to become. We all have um, ideas about ourselves that are not good, that are not productive, that hold us back. And here's just a just before I finish up here. I want to give you a little hack here to get in there and to disrupt your thinking because we all have, it's not, it's not, it's not the question of like, do I have some of these things? It's yes, of course you have some of these things. And it's like, well, how do I disrupt them? And which ones are current in my life? Which ones are flooding my life currently? And how do I get in there and disrupt them? And this is, I did, I did a, a happiness kind of hack with Instagram there in RSVP last Christmas. And I think like 94% of people who, 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 who did that happiness hack said their happiness increased. And one of the things I talked about was this, how to get in there and disrupt those thoughts. So, you know, if your phone is the last thing you check at night and the first thing you check in the morning, I would say that's not good for your, that's not good for your energy levels. That's not good for your mental health. That's not good for your well-being. What you need to start thinking about is write out maybe just three paradigms, three beliefs that you hold about yourself that you know are not so productive. Write them out. So it might be like, you know, to be loved, I need to I need to do things. I'm, I'm not valuable or, you know, uh, I don't think I'm enough. That's the one I hear a lot. I'm not enough. 
Okay. And so now write down three. This is what I would say. Just do this for two weeks and see what happens. Because I guarantee what you're going to do here is rewire your brain. Think of three things you'd like to say about yourself. I am enough. I am valuable. You know, people like me, right? Whatever it is. So write those down. And then at nighttime, before you go to bed, just have a quick re little read off them. And in the morning, have a quick little read off them again. So first thing going to bed, first thing going in, in the morning. And now over the course of a day, pick one of those things, like I am valuable, people value me, right? I am enough. Pick one of those things that you write down, just write down three. And then look for three examples during the day where you see that people do value you or people do think you're worthy or you are enough. Look for three examples. And when you come home, write down the three examples. And all you're doing there, you weren't born primed with this negative stuff in your head. I mean, you weren't born with these ideas, I'm not enough. You develop those as those neurons fire together and wire together. You develop that thought about yourself. That became a pathway because you looked around for evidence of that thought. And then you started to live it out. And you've been living it out for a long time. So what you're doing is you're running a neural circuit loop that's just an old, old belief. And it's like, well, you can live by that for the rest of your life. And at the end of your life, think, well, what the hell was all that about? Or you can start getting into it now and disrupting it. And this is what you do. This is how you disrupt and start to kind of rewire and start to think more positively. If you did that for two weeks and just tracked how you feel about yourself, what you're doing is you're reorienting your brain to a more positive position because, you know, you know, as a species, we are we are wired a little bit to look for the negative. And thoughts about ourselves, this is what neuroscience would show us, thoughts about the self are, are statistically indistinguishable from negative emotions. So when we generally overanalyze ourselves, we will feel that our lives aren't great and we're, we're not doing well in our lives and that you know em your emotions and your feelings will become disrupted because neuroscience shows us thoughts about self are actually indistinguishable from negative feelings and emotions, which will impact on your behavior. But when you start to rewire your brain and start to kind of look in, at things in a more positive way, which that little task is giving you, all of a sudden you start to think a little bit more positively and then start taking a little bit more risks and going out there. And just remember, you know, Freud said to us, we all have a compulsion, a compulsion to repeat the past. And so we get caught doing what's familiar and what's familiar because the world is so infinitely complex. Our brain is trying to, you know, resolve that complexity by feeding the same information and thinking the same things because the way you thought so far hasn't killed you. You didn't die. And so your brain is going to go, well, this works. And you have to ask yourself, well, is it really working for my life? Or am I running some ideas that are actually impacting on my joy and my ability to thrive? So that's what I just want to say to you today. Like, you know, we come from a really complicated family system, the most complicated system we'll ever organize, uh, ever, you know, manage and go through. And then we go into one ourselves, we set up our own family system. And so that, those early relationships impact on the story that we tell ourselves about who we are. And that story then gets entrenched and that becomes pathways in our brain. And so when we think about ourselves, we think about all those early, you know, labels that, you know, Again, labels don't predict the future. They write them. So when we hear, you know, those negative things about us as going through the school system and our family and our position in the family and then our personality traits, it impacts on the story that we tell ourselves about who we are. And it's like we got to get in there and disrupt it because all the research would say this is it. This is the only chance you get at this thing, life. And so we can live it in a way like that's like that or we can live it in a way like th that's like that. And it's like, OK, well, how do we do that last position? We start to reorient our brain and think more positively. And we, as T.S. Eliot would say, we dare disturb our universe. All right. Thank you very much. Richard, thank you so much for that. Um, Thanks, I was taking notes and then I just had to abandon it because it was just too much. And <laughs> listen, I'm very, very pleased to, to say that I'm actually past that 47.2 <laughs> stage in my life. Um, and I can totally, it totally resonated with me, I have to say. Um, really great stuff there about uh, how you can disrupt those thought patterns and, you know, thrive and, and go on to have like a, a completely different life. So uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, and I'm Lisa. sure there'll be plenty of questions about that uh, in our Q&A session. So look, we want to move on, keeping these um, fantastic speakers coming at you. Um, so next up, we have uh, Kel Callivan, who's otherwise known as Mrs. Smart Money, which sounds very James Bond altogether. Um, Kel is uh, a money mind coach, author and a QFA. And in 2018, Kel penned a sellout book, Mindful Money, Developing 
been a powerful uh, coaching formula that has been designed to help others take the stress out of the money um, in our lives and by creating healthy habits that lead to financial security. Um, you're very welcome, uh, Cal. And I think we'll all be hoping to pick up a couple of tricks um, here and abroad, especially with that mini uh, budget in the UK. But um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dee. It is absolutely brilliant to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to speak today and I hope for the next few minutes you'll come on a little journey with me um, and I'll make it as informative as I can. So I suppose to kick off, <sighs> we're in a very interesting time in our lives at the moment. We could not have predicted what, what has been happening in the last few years. There's been climate crisis, there's been Brexit, there's been cost of living crisis, there's been energy crisis, there's been job losses, there's been inflation, there's been so much going on, you name it, it seems to have happened in the last few years. And we couldn't have predicted any of it. Like it wasn't like a couple of years ago, we sat back and do you know what guys, there's a big bump in the road coming. We didn't know what was coming. And the, even the best, most highly educated people out there, they couldn't have predicted one thing after the next, one thing after the next, one thing after the next. And it can get really overwhelming because every time you turn on the radio, every time you look at the news, get a newspaper, uh, open up your phone, there is something new. There's a next crisis, next this, next that. And that is huge. That is a lot for your brain to be taking in on a consistent basis. And it really can put us into a mode of, is this ever going to stop? Am I ever going to be able to get that breathing space back with my money, back with my life, back with my headspace? And when we see all this, it can put us into this space of what's going to happen but what I want you thinking here is even though it is very noisy and we're living in a very noisy world we didn't have the internet back 50 years ago when other things were going on but when you break things down individually none of it is actually new we have had inflation before we have had inflation so many times before and even though inflation at the moment is running at nine a bit ten percent depending if you're looking at the EU or Ireland that is high, yes, but we've had it before. We've had pandemics and epidemics before. They are scary and they do have massive impacts on mortality rate, on the people around us, on our lifestyle, on everything. But like we've had epidemics even in Europe where like the Black Death, the Black Plague, that knocked out 30 to 50 percent of the European population in the space of four years. But we got through that. We got through the Spanish flu. We're getting through COVID. We've had wars before and they sound scary and we look at them in our history books. But the last 60 years has probably been one of the quietest times we have had when it comes to all out war on our planet since we have existed as, as a race here. So when you put all these things together and then there's the cycles of your recessions and your busts and your booms and all those things. It can just it, it, it can seem a lot, but we have had them before. We just have a few more together than what we normally get. But that doesn't mean that they're not manageable. Before we kind of move on too much further, inflation is a huge one for us when it comes to money. And I just kind of wanted to point this out, because when you look at inflation rates in Ireland alone, right in Ireland alone, not even including other countries over the last 40 years, we have had really big jumps in inflation. The younger generation coming up might not have experienced it so much, but we in the early 80s, like we hit a height of 24% inflation. There were mortgage rates being given out in the early 80s that were 18%. So when we're looking at mortgage rates now, yes, they are rising. Yes, they are enough to put your hair on edge, but there have been times before that they have been higher and we made it through. There are times before when we have had wars and we have made it through. There are times we've had pandemics, epidemics, and all these things. We have made it through every single one of them. And what I want you thinking, because when we're facing into winter and you're looking at all these prices rising, I want you to do something for me. It's a, it's, it's a trick. It's a skill, I would actually nearly say, more than anything else. And it is about your locus of control. And I know it was touched on earlier with earlier speakers, but this just shows how important it is to control what is within your control. So the locus of control was a theory developed by the guy with the most amazing name, I think, Julian B. Rotter. He was an American psychologist, but he developed this system. And it's so, so simple because it's, it's two. It's one or the other. And it is an 
internal locus of control or an external locus of control. And when you look at an external locus of control, that is when your life's happiness, when you are, uh, when things are happening to you as opposed to you controlling the world around you. And now at the moment with the internet and with everything that's going on, it can quite often be forgivable that sometimes our locus of control gets pushed outwards and we can feel that we don't, that we're a victim to everything that's going on. But if you can twist it back on yourself and look at an internal locus of control, that's where you can determine your own faith. And that's where a person where you can feel more in control of a situation because you sitting in your desk or at your standing desk or wherever you are at the moment, there are so many things going on that you at this minute cannot control. These big macro things that they're going on, yes, they're impacting our lives, but there is nothing you can do no matter how much you think about it or energy that you expend, worrying, stressing and all of that, it's not going to change it. However, what is within the locus of your control, what is within the bandwidth of your control, you do have control over that. It is something you can take action over and you can make a difference over. And particularly when it comes to your money, this is has never been more important than what it is now. And keeping yourself in the driver's seat of your money is so important because if you can control your money in a time of crisis like this, when we're at a kind of high inflation and job insecurity and all those things, you can manage your money and grow it at any time. So this is the baptism of fire, but it is the way that that if you can do it now, you can do it forever and ever. And it just gets easier as time goes on. And that's what we're going to cover from here on in. So what I'm going to really hit with work with you today on is a concept, a habit actually more than anything else. It's called pay yourself first. Now pay yourself first is quite literally it's a way of thinking about your money. And it's a way of managing your money that's a little bit different to the traditional way. So when you do your job, you do your job and you're commuting in every day, you're spending your time every day, you're, you've used your education, your experience, your training, you've had great bosses, you've had not so great bosses, you've commuted all these hours a week and all this energy and your genius has been poured into your job. And what that does is it makes your company better. It makes your company able to function and run and be the great company that it is. And in return for all this energy and time and experience, you get your salary or you get your money paid at, the, at, at every pay period. And that is your thank you for your job well done. And that's the win-win between you and your employer. But with this salary, when you get this salary, it has to pay for your life. It has to pay for your mortgage, your holidays, your pensions, your gifts, your food, your cars for saving, paying off debt, all of those things. And we don't necessarily get taught how to manage that money really, really well. And that's where a lot of us run into a bit of a pickle and we fall into old habits or what we've seen from our parents. But if you use habit of pay yourself first, it switches everything on its head. It puts you back in the driver's seat of your money, no matter what is going on in the environment around you. So what it is, I suppose how, what it is, the best way to explain it is by explaining the traditional way of managing money. And the traditional way of managing money is, it's quite literally, you get your, you get your salary at the end of every pay period. You know all these bills are coming in. There's the mortgage and the ESB and there's the broadband and all these things. You, all these bills are going out as direct debits and then life happens. And life happens and there's weddings and there's parties and there's events and there's book fairs and there's all sorts of things going on and there's eating out of those groceries and they all take their bit of your money. And you get rock up to the end of the month and you've promised yourself so many times, I'm going to save, I'm going to save, but there tends not to be anything left to save or something very little. And what that actually means is if you've gotten in your pay and you've paid all your bills and you've lived your life and you rock up to the end of the month and nothing is saved, you've essentially worked that month for free. And I know even if you love your job, there's a very good chance that you wouldn't do that job for free. When it comes to paying yourself first, it's making you the first bill every month. And what that looks like, it's as soon as your paycheck comes in, when your mortgage and all the other bills are coming out, you make yourself that first bill. And that first bill comes in many forms, but it's called your pay yourself first money. And it's your pension and it's your saving funds and it's the things that, you're, the things that build up your wealth. 
And when you do pay yourself first over time, because every month you're going to be moving forward, even if it's only a small amount. So anybody who isn't doing this and you want to start, we're looking at just small amounts. It's, we're looking at starting here. But what it'll do, it'll build up greater security. It'll increase your bottom line. You're sowing the seeds for your financial future and you're putting in the good savings habits to move you forward and this cushion will get bigger over time and it will protect you when you need it most for when the economy throws something at you or any of the things we mentioned at the outset of the conversation here when all those things are thrown at you you're going to be ready because you've built up this cushion and layers of protection and i know there are so many demands on our money so i just want to show this to you i think it's really important this, for anybody who's not aware, is the household budget survey. It's basically what the CPI index is built on. And it, what this little chart specifically is looking at, it's across Ireland, all incomes, demographics, locations, and it's taking how the average household spends its money. Now, I'm conscious it is 2015, 2016. It's done every five years, but with COVID, it got kind of slowed down a little bit. We will have a new updated one next year, but this is the best we have at the moment. But if you look at this across all of them, there's food and housing and fuel and light and transport. But I want you to take a look at this end one. This end one counts for 33% of the money that is spent by Irish households across Ireland. That 33% is miscellaneous. It's miscellaneous stuff. It's not your housing. It's not your transport. It's not your food. It's not the other things. And this is where your wiggle room is. These are the subscriptions that we forgot to cancel. These are the eating out when we know there's food in the fridge. These are the tapping the card when we're not thinking and we don't even bother to get a receipt to see how much it is. These are the things that can often we buy thinking they're a great idea at the time, but they end up in landfill in six months. This is all those sort of things. That's what's in this 33%. And that's where your wiggle room is. So I want you looking at that part of your outgoing and just seeing what you can do to free up even just like a small amount of money, every subscription that you're not using that you cancel, every time you kind of have a no spend day or just you know don't tap the card that day, bring your coffee with you. They are the ones that are gonna loosen up the money to start building your wealth. So without changing your lifestyle, without deprivation, without frugality, this is where I want you getting the easy, the cherry picking stuff first. This helps you start and starting is half the battle. When you loosen up that money, I want you to start thinking about where we're going to put it. And that's what we're going to talk about for, for the, the rest of this. A key part are your sinking funds. Now, a sinking fund, in its most basic form, it's, it's a savings account, but it's a labeled savings account. Because psychologically, if we put a label on something, we, can, we, we tend to use it for just that thing. And we're less likely to dip into the money for, for things that don't matter, like the take of Friday night when you're just bored or tired and you don't want to cook. We want the sinking funds used for solid things. And one of the main sinking funds that I want you looking at is a rainy day fund. And a rainy day fund, it's for the unexpected, expected things in life. And when I say that, I'm talking about, you know, when you put the car in for a service and the bill is way bigger than you were expecting and you don't necessarily have the money on hand for it, that's a rainy day fund item. And the things with the washing machine decides to pack it in on the worst day possible and it floods your kitchen floor, that's a rainy day fun thing. If your job security changes or a really pretty large bill lands in and you're not expecting it, these are all rainy day fun things. These are the things that if you're not ready for them and you don't have a little bit of money put aside to help cash flow that, it can really put a hole in your finances and set you back. So rainy day fund helps smooth out those things because they are going to happen. But just like a rainy day in Ireland, you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how like rain you don't know when it's going to rain you don't know how heavy that rain's going to be or how long that rain's going to last but you know it's going to rain and having your umbrella there as your rainy day fund it's going to give you peace of mind and it's going to help you just cash, smooth out your money throughout the month other sinking funds the christmas fund it happens every year it's an expensive time having a bit of money put aside for that makes christmas so much easier to enjoy anybody with kids Back to school is expensive. College is expensive. Putting a bit of money aside for that. And then one of my favorite ones, holiday fund. How nice would it be to go on holidays knowing you have the money already aside and you can just buy your plane tickets, buy your thing and just go enjoy it and not use the credit card. Have that there because you've earned that money. So they're just thinking funds. These are your cushions. And I want you thinking like layers building out to protect yourself from those big macro things that are going on. The other big one that I want to touch on is prioritizing your pension. This is a pay yourself first thing because there will come a time in your life 
when you either don't want to work or you can't work. And we do, we are lucky in Ireland in the sense that we do have the pension, but even if you get the maximum cont contributory pension in Ireland, you're still looking at 12, 13,000 a year. And if somebody said to you, hey, the only money you're gonna have coming in this year is 12 or 13,000, that's not necessarily the ideal place to be. It's a great starting point, but it's not the ideal place to be when you're hitting your 60s, 70s, 80s, and you want to go living or treating the grandkids or travel or doing all those great things you want to have a bit more wiggle room and that's why setting up your own pension and having that extra money to add to this is really important and we're very lucky because there are some great tax breaks you can get and depending on your age you can put in a certain amount of your gross income uh, in, into your pension and a lot of companies now that have an occupational pension scheme but auto enrollment is starting and you get these two extra wins generally with the occupational pension scheme right you have your money coming in but it's income tax free. So that is like an extra 40 odd percent you're getting free put into your pension. And this is invested in the stock market. So it's gonna grow over time. The second kind of side of it is quite often your employer might add money to it. That is free money. That is free money that you cannot, that well, I would recommend you don't leave on the table because you only get it by putting in money yourself. So you're getting this double win. So for you putting in, we'll say, let's say you do a company match you put in 100 euros of your gross salary, that's give or take like 50, 60 euros you'll be missing. The extra 40 euros is going to be put in because it's tax free. And if your company matches that, that's another 100 euros. So for 50 or 60 euros, you're getting 200 euros invested into your future. And what is brilliant in addition to that is this the earlier you start your pension, the better. Even if you can only put in a small amount, right, it's starting it. And this graph, and I'm conscious that it's in dollars, but sentiment is still the same. If you start early and let's say you put in 5,000 a year for 10 years when you're 25, 35, you can end up with over a quarter of a million sitting there for you to draw on when you can't or don't want to work. If you leave it a bit later, the other extreme here is 55 to 65 where it doesn't have the same length of time to run. It's a much smaller amount. It's just over 80,000. So what we're what I'm encouraging you here is start early, put in what you can, and you can build over time, but the main thing is to start it. So in summary, guys, there will always be cycles in life. Expect them. Things will always happen. Expect them and control what is within your control, because while you can't control them, if you expect them and plan for them, this will help, first of all, help you ride through as opposed to like, like knuckle roller coastering, roller coastering it through. But also if you start early and you have these things, you build them up over time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Small things do compound really well. Prioritize, pay yourself first and do it through your sinking funds, your rainy day funds and building up your pension. That's what I'm going to touch on today. Thank you very much for listening to me. You'll find me on Instagram and all those places. But thank you, Dee, so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Kel, thank you so much. Wow. That's an awful lot there. I think a few people were sort of moving on uncomfortably in their seats thinking I need to do this stuff. Um, keeping yourself in the driving seat when you're trying to, you know, look at your finances is a very, very good tip. And um, I love that 33% that kind of wriggle room that you mentioned as well. I think that's a really clever one because look, we're all guilty of that. You know, the tapping of the cards has become just way too easy you know you barely even know you've tapped it and you're on to the next thing so um i'm paying yourself first as well absolutely brilliant idea so look thank you so much fantastic tips and tricks there for everybody um so uh, we'll be back to you as well if you have any questions please as, as i say put them into the the q a box um and i'm delighted to get to our final expert speaker today um uh, Maria Macklin is an award-winning image consultant. Uh, Maria helps people to discover their personal brand and authentic selves by connecting with their inner personality to their outward persona. So a regular contributor to TV, radio and print, Maria enables and empowers her clients to feel confident and visually express who they are so they are seen, heard and valued without fear of judgment. Fantastic um, blurb there that you sent through, Maria. Thank you very much. So I'll hand over to you. You're very welcome. And uh, we'll see you at the end. Thanks a million. Thank you, Dee. Good morning, everybody. I'm holding up two packages. Which one would you choose? This one or this one? Most people choose this one. 
because it's neat, it's tidy, it looks a bit polished, it's organized, and there has been thought given to it. And most people don't really want this one because it's a little bit of an afterthought, it's untidy, it's messy. Actually, each package contains the same contents. They're both a CD, for those of you who remember what CDs were. And even when people are told what's inside, they often will still choose the one that's nicely wrapped. What is your packaging saying about you? When I think of accountants, really the things that come to mind and the words that come to mind are trustworthy, honest, reliable, discreet, professional, approachable. Is your packaging consistent with your brand, your values, what you stand for, and how you behave? And the next slide, please. Your brand is what people say about you when you've left the room. What are you leaving behind? And being consistent and authentic with your brand is key. It should represent the essence of you, so people know what to expect on, from you based on, their, on your visual. You can't not communicate. Everything you do makes some kind of statement. And the area of focus that I work with is on your visual appearance, your clothes. Your clothes make a strong statement about how you see yourself. Next slide, please. I've thought long and hard about my personal brand and about taking control of my image so that it's not left to chance. And I used to dress for how people thought I needed to be, which is the picture on the very left of your screen with where, where I'm holding my youngest. And I dressed in suits and it was a bit tailored, but actually I didn't feel like me. I never felt like me. My clothes were distracting to me. My performance dropped. How I was perceived wasn't right because I felt uncomfortable. Not only in the fact that the clothes just were uncomfortable, but I just felt uncomfortable because I hadn't got a sense of me. When I took control of my image, then I was able to really put my efforts into my performance and results and everything else. And so I have really honed in on four words that I use every time I'm thinking about my image. And those words for me are neat, organized, edgy, and fun. That's the essence of me. It doesn't change. It might evolve through my lifestyles and through the seasons of life, but those four words are always uppermost in my mind when I'm talking about my brand. It's really important that you have four words that you think about for your brand or five, but a, a group of words that really sum up who you are so that you can express what that is. That's when you get to your authenticity. Next slide, please. I'm sure you've heard the saying that first impressions leave, a, you know, you've, you don't get a second chance. First impression is a lasting impression. In an online study, 274 participants rated four images on five dimensions, confidence, success, trustworthiness, salary, and flexibility. And there was a man depicted wearing a bespoke made to measure suit and another man wearing a regular off the peg suit. And the suits differed only in minor details. The participants weren't told that the suits were different. The participants saw faceless images for a maximum of five seconds. And in every incident, the man was rated more positively on all attributes apart from trustworthiness when pictured in the bespoke suit. It was a study that was conducted about 10 years ago, and it was the first to investigate first impressions using time-limited images with minor clothing manipulations. Impressions arose only from the clothing. There was nothing else visible. So it does show that wearing the right clothes can affect how you're perceived by people. But it also shows how confident you're feeling and even how you're able to think abstractly. There's a separate study done, completed at Yale in 2014 that used 128 men between the ages of 18 and 32. And this will have an effect on, whether, on, on you when you're working from home. So listen, listen up. Researchers had participants take part in mock negotiations of buying and selling. Those dressed poorly in sweatpants and plastic sandals averaged a theoretical profit of $680,000, while the group dressed in suits amassed an average profit of $2.1 million. The group dressed neutrally averaged 1.58 million profit. And according to the co-author of the study, he was watching them participate and the poorly dressed participants would often defer 
to the suited ones for decision making, which was which is really interesting. We can't avoid first impressions. We automatically size somebody up when we meet them. And 55% of a first impression is based on the visual, how you present yourself, how you walk, how you talk, how you smile, how you react. 38% is based, based on the vocal, so how you say something, how you project, project whether your voice is friendly or not friendly, and only 7% is actually based on verbal, what you actually say. So when you're showing up for clients, for, for your customers, how you show up is important. It has to be authentic, but it also has to be appropriate. Appropriate is a way of expressing respect for the situation and the people in it. Next slide, please. The final study I want to talk to you about today is how clothes make you feel. And I kind of talked about this for myself, but psychological research has shown that what you wear changes your own behavior. So if you're doing a phone interview or an online meeting, or you're having an important negotiation on behalf of a client or with a client, shine up your shoes, how you dress matters. We know that the body's physical state can affect the mind, but Adam and Galinsky, psychologists at Northwestern University, took the science of embodied cognition to the next level, and they came up with the term enclosed cognition. So it's not only your body that can shape your behavior, but the shirt on your back. To test whether an outfit could trigger particular behaviors, they studied the effects of wearing a lab coat a garment associated with attentiveness and the care of doctors. Participants completed tasks while identifying the difference between two similar pictures while wearing the lab coat, looking at the lab coat, or doing neither. And performance improved significantly when the participants were actually wearing the garment, unless they were told it was a painter's coat in, under, in which circumstance their um, performance dropped. So wearing the right clothes can affect your own confidence, how you perform, and the results you achieve. Next slide, please. So when you get dressed every morning, and we all have to get dressed every morning, you can't get away from this really, you need to consider three things. Where are you going? What is the audience? What is the formality of the situation? Respect who you're hanging out with, and come back to the, those words that I mentioned at the very beginning. Do I look trustworthy? Do I look professional? Am I being authentic to me? Because when you're not authentic to you, people see through that very quickly. Are you too formal or are you too casual? Make sure that your clothes aren't distracting from the situation you're in. Check beforehand what the dress code is. And if there's a dress code, stick to it. Check the weather or the environment into which you're going. So if you're going on a day, day to the races, you might wear a different footwear than if you're going on a day into the office. It depends where you're going. So check that. There's a great scene in The Crown, <laughs> in, I think it's series two, where Margaret Thatcher is summoned up to Balmoral to meet the Queen and she turns up in a power suit and high heels and actually it's a day of shooting and she's so inappropriately dressed. It's so cringy. The whole emphasis is on her clothes and what she's wearing. So be careful about the statement you're making also. Be consistent to your personal brand and be authentic to yourself. You never have to apologize when you're authentic to yourself. The last thing I want to touch on this morning is impact. Often the requests, the biggest request I get from clients, every one, single one of them is, how do I dial it up a notch? How do I elevate my look? How do I look more important, more formal, more put together, more polished? So there are three slides coming at you. I want to just note the differences between this one and the next one. Slight changes there. You might have noticed that he has added a jacket. I have added a belt and a necklace. The next one. He has added a belt and a tie. And I have added a jacket. And so when you add little things like that, we call those points of interest. When you add those to your outfit, you elevate your look. You, you put on more of a coat of armor. It's like your, it's like your armor and you, you stand a little bit taller and you're perceived slightly differently. So check the formality of the, of the occasion that you're going into, dress appropriately, and you can either move it up like I've just shown you or take it down, of course. You might need to dial it down. So when he's wearing his jacket and his shirt and a tie, he's a bit more formal, more trustworthy. If you're meeting a client for the first time, that's generally how you approach them. As you earn your stripes and you earn your trust with that client, you can relax slightly and you might remove your jacket or you might come in with an open neck shirt. Move to the next slide, please. 
Of course, you might want to dial it down and appear more casual or approachable. And there's a fantastic scene in Schitt's Creek, for those of you who know it, where the, um, I can't remember their names now, I've lost their names, but the, the couple have to go out and buy a secondhand car. They've lost all their money. They've still got fabulous clothes because they managed to keep those, but they've actually got no money. They need to go out and buy a car and they want to buy a secondhand car. And they frantically run around the village to find clothes that will make them look poor and make them look like customers who are buying a secondhand car. Because if they go in and they close on the left, they'll get a different car and they won't, they won't, um, they, they'll end up over being, being uh, assuming that they're going to buy, spend more than they have. So the clothing doesn't just define who we are, what we're capable of, but it can influence not only how we feel, but how we were, how we're perceived. When it comes to inner confidence, sometimes the right outfit can look like a suit of armor to give you the boost that you need, not just to look the part, but to feel it too. I have a great quote, which I found, which was said by Carlo, Carlo Harris from Morgan Stanley. When you bring your authentic self to the table, people will trust you. And if you don't have trust, you haven't got a relationship. So be authentic to you, dial up your clothing when you need to, step into who you are, bring your whole self to work. Being authentic is your power, being consistent is your power, and feeling confident is absolutely your power. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. <clears throat> that, was yeah, yeah. that was fantastic. I picked up lots of things there myself. Um, really interesting. I love the idea as your clothes is like a suit of armor and just that uh, being authentic as well, I think is really, really important. And the points of interest, those little things that you can do to an outfit to just kind of elevate them as well. Very simple. So you don't need to spend a whole load of money. So um, we did actually get a question while you were chatting. So I'm going to kick off the, the discussion with everybody. Um, we might just bring everybody back in to the room or the virtual space, if you, if you like. Um, <clears throat> so the first question uh, to Maria, what if I'm on the uh, sorry, at the edge of my budget and don't even have the time for expensive clothes? So we're just going to touch on that there. But the idea of having to spend a lot of money, that bespoke suit versus the one you get in Duns, maybe. Well, the, the, the key here is to buy the best you can afford. Buy the best you can afford. You don't need to buy loads. So a, a very for someone on a budget, a working wardrobe might be um, two bottoms, three tops and a jacket. You know, you can you can make an awful lot of outfits with enough with very little. So my starting work capsule wardrobe might be 12 items. And with that, that will keep you going with for a week. So if you have two bottoms and three tops, that's two, threes or six. That's six outfits there already. Add a jacket and that gives you the armor that you need. Actually, what you need to do is buy the best you can afford. If you can't buy fit, afford a tailored suit, you buy the suit, you buy the best shirt you can afford. A shirt, a really good shirt will upmarket a suit. Brilliant. So that's that's one concept. simple way of doing it. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, thanks for that. I'd like to come to Richard now. Um, so we have somebody asking, uh, you talked about being a people pleaser and agreeableness and, and can, that, that can hold you back. Yeah. How can an employer or a parent um, be, how can we best arm our kids, sorry, uh, and young employees to navigate this trait? So that idea of being of people pleasing. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's very important as parents. We are, we, are, we have to make sure that our, I think a, a, a hugely significant thing for us as parents, we want our kids to be compassionate, but we also want them to have a bit of teeth as well, Dee, that they can stand up for themselves. And that's a really important thing. And, you know, teaching your kids to be able to manage Difficult difference and, and difficult people is a really important skill. So when they go into uh, into adolescence and into their uh, working life, that the, we all meet difficult people. That's just the way it is. That's the we meet people who are very disagreeable. Let's say, and if we have high levels of agreeableness, we can get walked all over there. And it's really important that when you're teaching your kids and when they're coming up and they're young, you show them how you actually show, you model it for them. That's a really important. You model for them how you don't actually take on everything and you say no and how you can say no to people and do it in a way that's respectful, but also respecting your own boundary. And again, key thing there is around boundaries for kids, teaching them how to manage themselves and how to understand that there's consequences for their behaviours, but also that they 
there's a, a really significant thing about having kids that are, are are confident is that they they value themselves and that they you know kids who don't value themselves say yes to everything and they're the kind of kids that get pushed outside a friendship circle because people they're not as you as you mentioned they're about being authentic they're not authentic to themselves they're trying to shape shift to suit all the people around them so that they'll be liked and when a kid is confident that's not how they're motivated that's not how that's not what drives them and as parents i think it's really important that we that we instill that in our kids teach them how to have a bit of teeth how to stand up for themselves and how to say no and when and, and how to sit with that discomfort when you say no to people that's a key thing i think we're not very good at that getting getting more comfortable with other people's discomfort is a key as a, is a key thing yeah brilliant and i think that I, I loved when you said that earlier about sitting with that discomfort of yeah. when you say no to somebody i think that's out of all of the things that you know you kind of think about it, it just seems like so kind of uh it's the wrong thing to do yeah. you know sit with silence and, and be awkward there and to model that behavior in our kids i think it's yeah. very difficult you know let's own it and say this is tough you know we have to kind of be our best selves with our kids and actually you know owning that kind of uh, behavior is is good yeah. as well i suppose um Absolutely. in the long run so i'd like to come to uh to neve now so um we have a question from uh, one of our audience they basically are saying they want to start, they want to make changes, but they don't know where to start. So a very, very simple question, but an important one. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that the quickest answer to that is to maybe take a look back at the, the six steps that, that I mentioned in terms of, you know, how to walk your way through it. But to start always with, with getting clarity on what you want the outcome to be. Um, because unless we know where we want to end up and unless we have a really good sense as to what that looks like or what that will feel like, it's very hard for us then to put in the necessary steps or to be able to map out or plan out how to get there. So it's so important. If there was if there was one takeaway, even in terms of in that answer, it's about get really clear on what it is you want. The, the final outcome, the end destination. And once you know that, then you can reverse engineer and work your way back. Yeah, so by maybe putting it into the sat nav and, and, and start from there. Absolutely, exactly. Neve. Yeah, yeah, great, great <laughs> advice. Um, and I have something here for, for Kel. So um, somebody's asking, very again, a very simple question, but a very important one. How much should a person be saving of their salary every month? That is a great question. The super short answer is, whatever you can if you're not saving. I know there are some, some rule, kind of general rules of thumb and one is the kind of the, the 20, 30, 50 rule. So 50 on your fixed expenses, you know, the mortgage, those kind of things, uh, 30 on living and then saving 20. But if you are just starting out and it's, you're not saving anything, 1% is your starting point and build from there. And if you can get to a solid 20%, you're winning. It doesn't have to be half your salary, but it, ideally, if you can make it consistent and easy for yourself, that's what you're looking for. And then if you can make it a game like that, if you if you uh, can get a better deal on something and it's reduced by 20 percent or 20 euro, put that into your savings pot. Don't just put it back into general spending. And that's how you're going to build it up bit by bit over time. And if you do that, then you're absolutely moving forward. Brilliant. OK, we all have to, we all have some homework to do there, I think. Um, I just have a final question then for, for Richard. Um, somebody is asking that if they're, if they're talking about their children here, um, if they are sort of noticing sort of unusual behavior or difficult behavior in, the, in their child, they really just want to know what that first step should be. So is it straight to a kind of a, a somebody like you or is it a GP or whatever? So I think, a, a, you know, it's definitely something that um, yeah. we need to give them a bit of support on. Sure, I would say no. It's not straight to a psychiatrist or psychologist. I think that's that's maybe an, an, a little more step down the road. But again, it depends on their age. You know, I, I don't know the age or the gender. Let's say here, um, do we know any of those? No, details? we don't have that detail. Yeah, no worries. Well, well, I would say always what you need to with, with your teenagers. Is, I'd say if it's a teenager now, it's harder, obviously, because they they rely more on their peer group. But um, depending on what age the child is, it's really important to have a conversation, open up the lines of communication with it with, a, say, a teenage boy. They would generally won't talk to you face to face. So the car is a great place to have a conversation with a teenage boy about what's going on. So they can look out the window and you can just chat as you're driving them to the match or whatever it is. Uh, you know, teenage girls might be a little bit more open. But again, depending on the child that you have. It's very important that you start with conversation around, you know, what's coming up for them, what's happening to them. Explain to them, you know, be be transparent about it. I notice things are going on here. You know, you're you're just not going out as much. What can you, you know, and have a nice little conversation about 
you know what's coming up for them. But again, always with teen. See, I don't actually know the age here, so I'm speaking generally. But if it's a teenager. You know, they will rely more heavily on their peer group. And if it is a teenager and you know their friend or you know their friend's parents, you could have a conversation with them and see has anything gone back to them from their from their child. Maybe they have a they have a more open relationship. So it's all we're always trying to get gather the most information that we can get from our child. And if it's persistent and it's ongoing, I would say yes, link in with your GP, have a conversation with the GP. But again, you don't want to you don't want to bring your kid to a GP without having a conversation with them. I think the, the key here is communication. And it's very important that we do build that communication before they go into adolescence because they will pull back from us and they will not look at us as the you know as the pillars anymore they'll they rely on their peer group a lot more and so that we, we do need to have that connection and that communication built before they get into adolescence so they will come to us about their issues a kid that say isolating is always a very worrying thing to eat, and it's something to keep an eye on if a child is isolating it's generally maybe a rupture in their peer group maybe they're gaming a bit more maybe it's about technology maybe they're being bullied maybe something has gone on in the peer group that they're not that they're not sorry um Sorry, my screen. Maybe there's something in their peer group that went on there that they're not able to um, manage. And so by having that first conversation with them and sitting down and you know what? Listening is a, a key thing talking to adolescents. Ask a few questions. And if you hear something terrible, you know, if they're telling you that something sexual or whatever, it's really important that you don't jump in there and judge. You just listen to them and that you ask them a few questions about what's going on for them. And we don't judge them very quickly or we don't try to rush to solve the problem very quickly. We allow them the space to talk. But I would say, no, don't go to psychotherapy or psych psychology straight away. Have a conversation with them. See what they say out of that conversation. And then if it's ongoing and you're still concerned, go to a GP, link in the, the GP. The GP then will refer you on. If they're concerned as well, the GP will link you link you in with a service. Okay, that, that, that's fantastic advice. Uh, and just really to say as well, as we're on this subject of mental health and maybe what might be going on for yourself or your children, there is Thrive as well. They're, um, we're open during office hours and you can contact us out of hours via the website. Um, there's a full complement of, of mental health uh, supports and services there for our members and our students and their families, of course. So Richard, that was great advice, very important advice. Um, but look, we have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, what a great discussion. I, I have to say, I've, I've learned so much this morning in, in one hour um, by, from all of you. And um, I hope our audience are the same. I think uh, I think everybody has taken something away. I'm sure everyone's taken something away. Um, so just to each and every one of you, thank you so much for coming along this morning and um, being honest and open and shining the light on stuff that is difficult for, for lots of people. Um, and um, we really are very, very grateful. And we hope... Maybe the next time we'll see you in person in the Institute and, and see our members and our students in the Institute in person. But but for now, um, just thank you very much. Um, all of you have a great weekend. And for our audience, um, I just wanted to now introduce uh, Neve Manning, who is our fundraiser and marketeer um, par excellence of the, um, the CA support, which is the Benevolent Fund in the Institute. And this is a fund really that we have set up for our members um, who might be going through difficult times um, providing financial assistance. So I don't want to give too much away. Neve, I'll hand over to you. So thank you very much. Yeah, hello everyone. I uh, hope you are enjoying the morning so far. So as Dee mentioned, my name's Neve, and I'm the Marketing and Fundraising Officer for CA Support. Um, so I won't take up too much of your time, but just wanted to quickly jump on ahead of the coffee break to talk to you about CA Support and uh, the services we provide to the Chartered Accounting Community. Uh, for any of you who are unfamiliar with our work, CA Support provides emergency financial assistance to members, students and close relatives of the Institute who are experiencing you know, serious financial hardship due to a variety of uh, difficult and challenging situations. And um, so I suppose, you know, the beauty and tragedy of life is we don't always know what's in store. Um, and I know for CA Support's uh, beneficiaries, it was almost inconceivable that they would ever need such support. However, each week, members of our community do, in fact, reach out to us for um, advice and help with their financial circumstances. Um, in the past year alone, we have supported over 48 individuals and families and provided them with the stability and security needed to overcome their financial difficulties, you know, enabling them to get back on track so they can, you know, begin to build a better life for themselves and their loved ones. Um, every beneficiary has their own personal experience and story to tell. Some are facing unexpected and life-changing diagnoses and illnesses, redundancy, family crises, um, all of which, you know, has severely impacted their financial well-being. 
Um, so I'd just like to share a few um, of our beneficiary stories, which I think kind of really highlights and demonstrates the importance of such services like CA support. Um, and we have changed their name for the purpose of this. Um, so Sarah, a young mother, contacted CA support when she received um, an unexpected cancer diagnosis. Um, as a result, CA support was able to assist her with the mounting uh, medical and childcare costs she faced. Um, Liam um, sought out CA support assistance when he received redundancy and was finding it increasingly difficult to keep up with his household bills. And um, so C CA support's help, Liam was able to keep his head above water until he secured a new role. Ruth contacted us when she was dealing with the effects of an acrimonious divorce and was feeling, you know, particularly overwhelmed. She reached out to us for help with her mortgage repayments just to ensure she didn't fall into arrears and was able to protect her family, uh, her and her family's home. And then we have John, um, an elderly member. He was struggling with the financial burden of replacing an essential medical device. Um, and thankfully, CA support was able to step in and cover the cost of this. So I hope those few stories just kind of help convey just how necessary and beneficial uh, donations are to those who contact us. Um, with the current economic climate we find ourselves in, we do expect demand for our assistance to increase even further this year as financial pressure persists. Um, so, you know, for those already experiencing financial pressure, the impact of this will be even more devastating. Um, so uh, CA Support is a charity that relies exclusively on the goodwill of members like yourselves. And now more than ever, we need your help to continue to support uh, chartered accountants and their families in need. So donation to CA Support, you know, helps us offer the right support at the right time and to those who need it most. Um, so in a minute, you will see a QR code pop up on your screen. If you are in a position to do so, uh, we would hope that you might make, consider making a donation to CA Support and, you know, really help out your uh, fellow chartered account members and their families who are struggling. Um, so short and sweet, but I think that's it for me. Uh, thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of Step Into Your Power and I'll pass you back over to Dee. Thanks a million, Neve. That's great. Um, just to say that we're going to now take a 10 minute coffee break. So to go and grab um, a couple of refreshments or whatever to keep you going. And we'll be back here at 1130 for a panel discussion with our deputy president, Sinead Donovan, and um, a selection of our members as well. So we look forward to seeing you back here in 10 minutes. So see you then.
Uh, welcome back, everyone. Hope you have had the coffee and, and the snacks. Keep you going. Um, really looking forward to this discussion uh, hosted by, as I say, our deputy uh, vice uh, deputy president of the Institute, I should say. Sorry, Sinead. Currently a partner and a chairperson at Grant Thorn Thornton. Um, Sinead joined the firm in 2002 and became the first female partner a mere three years later in 2005. And um, over a, a, an impressive career spanning 20 years, Sinead has enjoyed many pivotal roles, including president of Accounting Technicians Ireland, chair of our good old CA support in-house charity, and is a passionate advocate of the Institute's DNI committee, um, to name but a few. So we're delighted and just a little bit excited that Sinead will be coming uh, in as president next year and will be the only the third female president since its inception in 19, sorry, 1888. So you heard that right, 1888. So a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, alarming that. But anyway, Sinead, we're relying on you there to, to close the gap. Um, so we're all really looking forward to seeing what Sinead is going to do as she smashes through the ceiling um, when she gets into that space. So Sinead is a mother of two. And in her spare time, I don't know how she has spare time, but she does. Um, she's an avid participant in triathlons and Ironman competitions. I mean, wow. So Sinead is now going to host a discussion exploring the overall theme of the event, which is, as we all know at this stage, building confidence, overcoming the inevitable challenges that arise and then that important thing of asking for help so um, when those times do arise and, and we get into difficulty. So we're delighted to be joined by three of our members Amna Salomon, Sharon O'Hagan and Peter Gillen who will walk through some of their own personal challenges and share how they overcame them and we're also delighted to be joined by Rachel Tuberty from PeopleSource, our sponsor of course for this event, um, who will offer a unique perspective on what she has seen in the candidates that engage with her services. So I'll hand over to you Sinead, looking forward to this and we'll catch up at the end. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks a million, Dee. Um, and uh, what an amazing session so far. Um, there's been so many takeaways and, and I personally just love the, the title, Step Into Your Power. It, it, it's brilliant. Um, and it all seems to be centered around self-confidence and, and management of, 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 of ego and agreeableness. I, I love it. So look, what I'm going to try and do for the next 25 minutes, 30 minutes or so is, is try and bring some of those um, topics to life. Um, we've got a fabulous um, panel of members and, and, and our sponsor um, here to talk about it. We will delve into some personal personal stories um, and then we'll also probably touch on some maybe some so, some advice um, for, for, with the wisdom in the panel, some advice as to um, as to how to navigate your your career and some of the challenges that you may um, may come across. So. Um, Dee has introduced the, the panelists. So look, I, I'm going to try and maximize the time here. And, and I'm going to start with you, Amna, if, if that's OK. You're, um, you're a recently qualified um, ACA, as I know. And I suppose for, for me, I'm just keen to hear your, your journey, um, why accountancy, maybe some of the challenges you may have experienced in, in, on your route. And um, yeah, just, just really keen to hear your story. Well, thank you for having me here. And um, I would like to start off saying that, as, as I've been introduced, my name is Amna. Um, I, I'm originally from Pakistan, and I moved to Ireland when I was 13. So I did my secondary school in Ireland, but uh, I didn't have any English when I moved to Ireland. And um, I didn't have any career goals, what I wanted to do in my life. And it turns out when you have a very little English and your parents who doesn't really understand the Irish educational system, it's just not a good combination. So for a year after I did my Living Cert, I went, just went around and did a bit of experience in a different sources, like what I want to do. I went to solicitor office, accountant's office and see what really is interesting to me. And from there on, I had a bit of interest in the accountancy and I went on and did the accounting technician um, and uh, I qualified from accounting technician. And then I decided, OK, I want to pursue my career somewhere I knew. But I'll be honest with you, at that time, I wasn't really sure whether I really want to be an accountant or not. So I went on and did my cap one. After doing my cap one, there was a bit of um, turning point in my life. I was very young at that age. I was only 22. And all of a sudden, I was in a situation where I was, um, without going too much into detail, I was homeless. I was very alone in terms of relationship. And I couldn't really figure out how I got myself into that situation. So at that time, somehow CA found me. So I do want to say in, in this, 
I am one of the beneficiary who actually received the CA support back then because my situation was really, um, I wasn't able to handle a lot of things. As I said, because I didn't know what was going on and how to overcome it, I didn't know because of the lack of experience I had. And I didn't really know how to ask for help as well because the culture I come from, everything you have to do yourself. It's a very independent thing. You need to figure out your life yourself without asking anybody. It's just... Maybe it's that, 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 um, that's the way I've been brought up, but I don't really agree with that very much. So when I completed my CAP 1 and whatever was happening, I wasn't able to pursue my education. And that was honestly the last thing in my mind. So I dropped out of the institute. But at back of my mind, I knew that I wanted to get qualified so after five years. I don't know if most of you know that um, we have eight years to get qualified. So after five years, when my life was a little settled, I decided to go back into the college and I, I was very determined, no matter what happened, I am going to get qualified, even if the world is going to end. And guess what? When I joined the CAP2, there was COVID-19 and everything was changing. And within that, there was another personal event, like my, um, another, again, my life took a U-turn all over again. But this time I was determined I'm not going to um I'm not I'm going to finish my qualification. One of the things that actually one of the challenge I had was when I was doing my exams during my I was in the training contract as well and my mom had a stroke. Richard mentioned something very interesting earlier on, saying that when you're elder in the family, responsibility fall upon you. And I'm kind of the eldest in my family. I have other five younger brother and sister. So it was, CAP 2 was so hard because we were so close to exam. It was March and then exam was upon me. There was a trainee contract. There was, I just didn't know where to go from there. And that's when I reached out to CS support, two lovely ladies, Dee and Francesca, who has always helped me. And they encouraged me and then maybe told me, okay, there's a lot of people who go through similar situations. I was like, okay, that's fine, but I still don't know how I'm going to do the training contract, how I'm going to do my exam, and how I'm going to be the mommy in the house. It's just very new for me. I'm not, like, I used to go to my parents' house maybe four times a year, and then compared to when I have to move back in and just handle everything, it was just all, every everything was too overwhelming for me. And at that time, my employer um, reached out to me, and I had two options. I was thinking, should I just tell him that, I'm going through family difficulties because whenever you say family difficulties, people don't like to extend conversation because it's a very touchy subject and nobody wants to go personal. So, and I was like, oh, should I just be honest? So I was like, ah, sure, what's the worst gonna happen? So I told my boss, my mentor, Shane, that um, actually this is what be happening. And I was not expecting the response from him, what I got. And he was like, Amna, you started, this journey with us and we want to help you complete this journey what we can do to help you to complete this journey and there I was like I don't really know what you can do because there's a lot of things and it was like think about it but I want to let you know whenever you want to come back there's always a job for you so that kind of really kind of eased a lot of my ease a lot of my stress like you know okay so there's people out there who are willing to help out in those kind of situations so and my mom was in coma at that time as well so I decided okay so I'm in April now and the exams in June luckily because of the COVID everything moved to online so exam was pushed forward to March which worked out really well for me so what happened was um during that period my mom actually got out of the coma and she healthy and everything she got healthy well she wasn't there where she was before but she was getting better so I um, decided okay I'm going to do the exams and that's where the support Francesca and D was there whenever I'm stressed and I feel like I can't do it I pick up the phone call and they're just there they're like two power women who really helped me complete my CA journey so yes I did my exams and I passed my exams as well and then when I was doing the FAA exams as well, I know it sounds so weird. Like sometimes when I look back, I really ask myself, how the hell one person can go through so many situations? I don't know. I can't answer that. But when I went on to do my FAA exams, all of a sudden, um, I like just before the exams, I was all prepared, good to go. 
10 minutes before the exam my little sister called me and she's like uh, why are we having for lunch and I was like why are you calling me I'm just about to go on my exams I do not cook for you and I don't know how to no cook well mom and dad is not here I was like where are they and then certainly the packing panic kicks in and then I find out that my mom is in the hospital she has to go for an emergency surgery and I'm like, okay, because my younger siblings, they're like suicide squad. That's what I call them. They are so, so mischievous. We have two Hurley Quins in the family, and it's just more than enough for anybody. And I was so concerned, and plus they were so hungry. So I had 10 minutes. I rang Francesca. I was like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. And she was like, I'm going to do whatever you can. Do you want us to postpone, like, maybe exam to an hour or something like that would have I was like I don't know what I want to do and she was like just calm down take a deep breath and then we were like on the call for five minutes and I was like okay I know what I have to do now so what I did was order the food for my siblings for just eat and tell them collect the food have the food and do not open the door if anybody comes in and they don't really listen to me to be honest when it comes to those situations but I was like if you do listen to me do and then do not open the door I promise I'll bring the dog and we'll take the dog for a walk right so and uh, I went on and do my exam but I was really trying to focus but I was not able to I don't know like I just wasn't able to focus enough like I my mind keep going back to okay what's happening like you know and um so what I did was I finished my exam and back home and just like was there with my family and then was there for the next day and then came back and do my audit exam as well and look somehow I don't know how I passed my exam but I do want to know I wouldn't be sitting here today if I didn't ask for help and if I wasn't open in I'm not I'm not wow um, I, I, I don't know where to start but first off just to say a huge congratulations to you um for a number of things. One, for getting through that journey and um, qualifying. Two, for being brave enough to share that story with us now. And three, for being wise enough and brave enough to ask for help um, when you did. And, 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 and really, I think that's, that's, you know, for me as Deputy President of the Institute, I call it the family of accountants. And, and, and I think this is, you know, an example of where the family has, has kicked in to help. But I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a pause um, because there's so much there that we have all digested. I'm going to come back to you with some questions, if that's OK, because there's an awful lot I want to explore with you. But um, the resilience, the strength and the stepping into the power that you've shown and getting to where you are now is uh, I just want to commend you on that. It's well done. Um, Sharon, may, maybe I can move on to you. Um, I um, I know from 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 doing some research, you're you're a member. You've had some twenty years experience in in various companies and multinationals. But I suppose more recently and over the last ten years, you, you've you've moved into to coaching to help in I think in particular female financial professionals. And and in your biog, you say you know to help them achieve their potential, but also overcome burnout. And, and and I suppose I'm, I'm keen to to understand why you, you you made this pivot, and and two, you know, is there any words of wisdom um, for us as as we all navigate so many different challenges in our life? Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Um, it comes from my own experience. So about 10, 11 years ago now, I faced burnout, and really, what's important to know, it came out of nowhere. So, you know, sometimes we think it will build up over time and we'll catch it, but it didn't. So at the time, my attitude to work. So I had two, my babies were only two years of age at the time. So I was a new mother. I had also set up my own accountancy practice, um, which specialized in outsourced finance directors. So I was working with a lot of large organizations and my attitude really was focusing on work. I was trying to be this super accountant and super mother at the same time. When my kids would go to bed, I would go back to work, you know, so they'd go to bed at eight o'clock at night and you nod your head. I'm sure you've done the same, Sinead. And, you know, we're accountants. We seem to go from one deadline to the next deadline. There always seems to be this barrage of work coming. And I suppose for me at the time, it was a new business. I used to charge per hour. So one of my psyches at the time was, well, if I'm not working when my children are in bed, I'm depriving my family of money that I could be earning. It's an awful toxic attitude, but... It is something that I had in my um, late 20s. 
And then the other side was, well, if I can just get this body of work done, I'll start tomorrow, you know, with less work. And as we know, you know, nature pours a vacuum. We clear a lot of work and more comes down. So I think I thought I was invisible, invincible. I think we all think we're invincible. And, you know, if I look back, my self-care was non-existent. I probably thought, well, you know, I'm a busy person. I'm developing my career. I don't have time for self-care. And what I would say to people is really, really be mindful of that because the journey back can be, you know, it can be difficult. We we kind of get there. So, but if we can be mindful of our self-care and that is small things like taking our breaks, taking our lunch hour. Um, I was notorious for working through lunch because it was an extra hour that I could work. So taking our lunch breaks, taking our our lunch hour. Um, I, you know, I say to people, here's a glass of water. Um, hopefully you can see that there. You know, if you think that represents our energy and we're giving that out constantly to other people, to our families and um, in work environments. And unless we're replenishing that with something for ourselves, it's going to run out and it can be quite physical. So my burnout came in the form of a panic attack. And I was on the M50 driving along on the way to work, thinking of I have this meeting to go to. Then I'll go to this meeting, you know, planning our day out as we do. And out of nowhere, I had the most frightening panic attack. And if anybody um, has had one before, it is really a scary experience. I thought I was actually having a heart attack. And to have cars driving past you at 120 kilometers an hour when you, you can't breathe or you think you're having a heart attack, is very scary. And that actually developed into panic disorder. And what I'd say is I would have counted myself as someone very resilient. Um, you know, there was tragedy in my life before and I coped and I survived is what I would say. Um, but it really can come out of it really can come out of nowhere, Sinead. And I suppose that that's what I do now today is I work with organizations. I work with individuals, help them to manage or overwhelm, help them to manage stress and help them, you know, to develop into leaders but not in a way that also means they have to sacrifice their health. You know, so what I realized at the time was, okay, and, and I think it was Neve who said this today. So the panel that we had on earlier were brilliant. I recognized a lot of things in what they said. You know, this is our responsibility. So at the time I thought this is happening to me. It developed into panic disorder. I couldn't stand in a queue and super value for bread. I had to run out. You know, that's how severe it went. Um, out, and, and out of nowhere is what I would say. But Neve was right in what she said, that we have to take responsibility. We can sit there. It's not our fault. You know, I thought maybe I wasn't cut out for finance. It absolutely wasn't that. It was I had to change my attitude. I had to change how I worked. I had to change what I prioritized in my life. So it's that's what I help teach people. It's about taking responsibility and recognizing that there are elements that we control. You know, there will be there will always be stress in our work life, but it has, doesn't have to be as toxic as I let it happen to. And also I work with organizations as well, just to help them, just to teach their employees of what they can do for themselves, you know, better work practices. Sometimes we feel so overwhelmed because we feel we've more to do than the time that we have. And how can we manage that? So it's all of those kind of topics, our attitude to work. And um, yeah, so that's my background tonight. Again, again, inspiring, inspiring um, story and, and, and well done, Sharon, is all I can say. I, I think it pivots back to some of the, the topics from earlier on in, in the panel. I mean, they, they, they talked about people pleasers and they talked about agreeableness and kind of that want that we all want to be liked. And, and by doing that, we all kind of say yes a lot. And I think what you're saying, Sharon, is sometimes you need to be a little bit selfish to a certain extent to look after yourself. We really do. I think we put and, you know, I think sometimes we put ourselves to the bottom of the list. I know I certainly did. So, you know, my children would come first, anything that any of my clients would need. My husband, everybody came first. And in my mentality at the time was if I can keep all of them happy, then I'll be fine. And it's just not sustainable, Sinead. And putting ourselves first isn't selfish because it means that we can help those that we want to so I mean that can be simple as having an after work activity so you know maybe it's something that you like that you want to go I am I know someone I work with they've taken up boxing and it means it gives them another dimension to their life she's four children she works very hard but this boxing is for her and she leaves work on time and now she realizes well hang on I can leave work on time two days a week to do boxing actually I can leave work on time 
every day. So it's not a work to real, but she's smarter now. She's more organized when she goes Thank into you. work. Um, so it, it and it, it's living a whole life as well. You know, it's not just our work life, our home life, our family life. It's it's making it all work together Absolutely. ourselves at the forefront of that. Absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you. And, and I like the box. You know, I suspect she gets an awful lot of frustration out as well in the boxing. He loves so it. Much. Yeah. Um, great, Sharon. We'll we'll come back to you later. Um, Peter, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you. Um, you you're, you're kind of sitting amongst a, a powerhouse of of women here, but 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 I know from working with you that you're absolutely a powerhouse of a man. Um, and I suppose my question to you is, again, similar to to, to Amna and Sharon. Talk to me a little bit about your journey. I know you are involved in a huge amount. Uh, you were a finalist in the, the the Young World or the Young Chartered um, Star um, last year. Hopefully I got that right. I know you're involved in sustainability in the Younger Professionals in the Institute, um, whilst holding down um, manager in, 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 in one of the big five firms, Grant Thornton. Um, it's no longer a big four. So, Peter, do you want to um, talk to me about your journey and, and how you managed to juggle everything? Absolutely. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here amongst uh, such an esteemed uh, uh, panel. A bit of imposter syndrome kicking in, but we'll get on with it. Um, I suppose, um, in terms of my journey, I guess after college for me, it was very much about, okay, well, what do I want to do? And I think like a lot of people didn't know what that final destination is. And I think there's this, uh, I, th I think there's a, almost an expectation like, oh, you have to know exactly where you're going at all times. And for me, well, for me personally, I just think that's a, putting a lot of pressure on ourselves and a bit of an unrealistic uh, expectation for a lot of people. So I thought, what can I do to give myself the best opportunities and the largest breadth of opportunities? And for me, that's why, for example, I actually turned to accountancy because family, friends and family members basically told me, Peter, look, it's a great international passport. It allows you to travel around the world, allows you to work in pretty much any sector you desire because everyone, every, every type of institution, big or small, Need, needs an accountant at the end of the day and as we're seeing now as you, as you mentioned I'm working in sustainability like I never would have imagined that that would lead me that way like I started off uh, as an IT auditor a risk advisor uh, a few years ago had a great time great experience learned so many transferable skills now all of a sudden I'm in a very different space that's ever growing as we're seeing from the papers and the media day in day out so to me like uh, getting, I kind of the, that, again going back to that's how I approached it I, gave, I wanted to give myself the best opportunities and then going back to what you're saying in terms of even man, for me it's time management and like having a rough plan on a page again I don't know my my exact my exact destination but I like to kind of have a rough plan in place to give myself hopefully the best opportunities Um, again that for me that just comes back to actually every January I just have a process where I sit down and I scribble a few notes down thinking inside work what do I want to get out of this year where where am I where 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 are my gaps in my skill set skill set because look no one's perfect it's not possible but we can do our best to it's all about incrementally improving it's all those little habits um and then for example whether it's on a quarterly basis reviewing that plan is it still appropriate of course the plan it has to change you have to be agile to move it and then then that, and that relates to both inside and outside of work. Look, like life is so much more than what we do nine to five. It's uh, the relationships we have. So, for example, for me, um, honestly, engaging with people and just being part of a community, that's just a very important value and principle to me personally. And it is one of the reasons I got involved with the Institute at True the Young Professionals, for example. Um, so, like, I have my, the way I would phrase it, I have my, my family family, I have my work family, and then I have other families outside and other communities going back to you. The, the, the chartered family you mentioned earlier, Sinead. Um, but it's, I think it's, for me, it's really, it's it's great to have those outlets and those support structures there so that when you need them. So for example, when I was going to the exams, um, like, look, we all have our trials and tribulations at different points. And like, yeah, I, I certainly found them challenging, but it's great to have those communities to turn to, whether it's, you know, even just the little conversations or the big conversations, but it's having that having that spectrum of people you can go to for different things. Um, I that's what I, that's that that's what I've taken out of out of the last few years. Brilliant, thanks, Peter. And 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 look, I mean, I think I think what you've mentioned there about I mean, every January you write down your goals, professional, or you said inside and outside of work. That that's very much something that that Neve touched on earlier this morning um, about defining what you want to become or, or addressing what you want to become. And, 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 and I know certainly for me, that that's something that I, I try and do um, every so often as well. But 
I mean, maybe that's a nice point to pivot to, to, to yourself, Rachel. I mean, Ra Rachel, you're our sponsor of the event, and thank you very much for that. We wouldn't be able to run events like this without you. Um, no you you've also been in the recruitment um, sector for, 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 for a number of years. And, a long and, time, Sinead, a long time. That's what we said. Um, and, and I mean, I think you, you probably witnessed a whole generation go through with, with careers, um, is, is, is goal setting something that you think is important, that you see enough of, that you see too much of? Um, no, no. So a couple of, couple of things, just when Peter said when he left school, he didn't really know what he wanted to do. So he picked accountancy. I, my neighbour is a career guidance teacher and he came into the house the other day. He's going, what am I going to do? And he said, 10% of people know what they want to do in, leaving, in their leaving search year. The other, there might be 10% that are, you know, just probably go into family business or whatever, but really you're looking at 80% of people who don't know what they want to do. And I will always, my friends, kids, are always say, oh, please go into accountancy because if you look at all the businesses that have been run, um, most of those are headed up by an accountant, you know, or you could set up your own business or, you know, so I, re I really do try to push them in that direction. But all they hear often is three and a half years beyond college. I mean, that's just hard that's hard going um but then in, you said about goal setting um i love peter's idea of setting a goal every year that's great but i do think i definitely feel the people who get to where they want to go go more quickly are the ones that have a plan a, a, an outline of a plan in place so for example there's a, a big plc out there and when they interview one of the first questions they ask at interview is where do you see yourself longer term? Now, you're a qualified accountant at this stage, you've passed all your exams, but they will then try and build your career. So if you say, actually, I want to be in general management or no, I want to do corporate development or no, I want to be a CFO, they'll try and build your career. So if you, so, you, so you've got a bigger, a, a better chance of trying to get, of getting there more quickly. So mm -hmm. I do love people who have a career goal, but I did do a little survey there the other day and 75% of people said they don't have a career plan. So really? I, yeah. And when I hear like um, Peter talking to his family members and I'm talking to mentors, you know, the, the importance of having those mentors or dealing with your career guidance, it does. It really just helps people get there more quickly, I think. Yeah, but also just kind of sets them on the journey. I think that the, the analogy of a GPS was used earlier today as well, and it's it's very much the direction of where you want to go. Yeah, I, I yeah I do think you'll you'll get there. Yeah, I do think you'll get there more quickly if you have some sort of plan. It doesn't have to be set in stone, but if you know you want to become a CFO or you want to start a business, like I'll use my own example. I started People Source in 2015. I was 45, what? Um, but I had two other opportunities earlier in life to do the same thing. And I never took it. I didn't have the confidence to do it. And I look at my peers and, you know, people have been in recruitment for two years were setting up their own businesses. I was like, Jesus, they are so, so strong. But I just didn't have that plan in my head. And I should yeah. have done it earlier, absolutely. But people- But you know what? Time. You know what? You did it. You did it. You I did it eventually. Up. Eventually. I got there in the end. Congratulations to you. Um, we're, we're coming up to two minutes to go, and I'm delighted that Dee's going to have to sum, sum up this um, this session and come away with some of the takeaways, because because there's just so much. I want to I want to come back to you all for the last two minutes. I want to do a quick fire. Um, and the question I'm asking for you is, what, what are your goals or what do you want from 2023? You don't have to go into too much detail if you don't want to, but but but, but what, what, what are your aims? What are your vision? I, I'm not going to come to you. So... Professionally, I'm like I need to develop my career at the moment. So I've done the exam, which everybody thinks is the hardest part. It's not. There's more to it after it. So at the moment, my goal is to a communication skills with the client. There's a certain way you need to communicate with the client in order to get what you want as being a senior auditor. That's kind of part of our job. So that is my goal for the next year. Okay, I have no doubt you will get it. You Thank will get whatever you set your mind to, Amna. Uh, Sharon, 2023, I can't believe we're hitting, it, hitting into it. I know. Um, mine is really just to reach more people, Sinead, just to be talking about overwhelm, be talking about mental health. Um, 
and just be able to show them that there is a lot of it within their control too, that there's a lot of things that we can do and let's not wait for it to think, oh, it will just go away because it won't just go away. So that's, that's really my plan next year is reach as many people as I can and help them. Love it, Sharon. Reach as many people, set, spread the message and control the controllable. I, I, I like that. Peter, what, what are you going to do? Hopefully you're going to still be in Grand Thornton and you're not allowed to leave. Absolutely, not going anywhere anytime soon. Don't worry. Um, you know, for me professionally, I suppose. Um, again, I'm working in sustainability. Sustainability reporting is becoming an ever increasing important topic. So, looking to really improve my technical knowledge in that area. But outside work as well, honestly, looking to probably take better care of myself. Um, physically, you know, to uh, a bit more exercise would do no harm personally. Okay, very very honest. And uh, and Rachel, 2023. 2023 is to get back meeting clients face to face, like in person. For the last two years, I've been doing it over Zoom, and I really know those relationships aren't as strong over Zoom versus over a coffee where you can talk about, you know, family and personal things as well. It, it, a Zoom call is very quick, sharp to the point. So it's to do that. And then on a personal level, I took up, up um, piano in COVID. So I'm going to do my grade five in 2023. Well, the best of yeah, luck to that, Rachel. We'll have you at the Christmas lunch next year on Tinkling oh, the Ivory. Chance in hell. <laughs> but thank you for today. I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you very much. No, look, look, I want to say thank you to all the panel. Um, I could have sat chatting to you for, for the whole morning. Um, and congratulations to everyone. You, you were very open. You were very transparent. And you were very brave. And that's what today was all about, stepping into your power. So, so thank you very much for that. Dee, I'm going to pass over to you. What a super, what a super wow. session. Wow. Look, thank you so much, Sinead, to Sharon, to Amna, to Peter, to Rachel. I mean, you're absolute rock stars in my mind. Just come on and talk openly about the difficult stuff that we've been touching on today. Um, I think just in, in kind of a final few words, just to say thank you to everyone in the Institute that kind of supported us in getting this off the ground. The young professionals as well were, were um, involved as well along the way. We're delighted with that. Um, and we just hope that um, we can all get back to the, that sort of human um, connectivity and that in-person stuff because I think it's really really important and even just the kind of challenges that are coming up for people that human contact we're all human and we need that connection and you know whether it be the sort of the mentoring or the the career planning or whatever like actually having a coffee with somebody and 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 shoot the breeze is, is just ultimately as, as important as it gets so I hopefully we'll be seeing that a lot more in 2023 so thank you so much everybody um great session and hope everybody took something away from that so look after yourselves enjoy the sunshine this weekend take care thanks a lot